test. There, oh, that was me. Sorry, I messed with it. They told me not to mess with it. I had, a, had one job, and I didn't get it right. Thank you. Uh, well, good. Oh, that moves, too. All right. We're just, we're just um, that's, that moves, so don't put weight on that. There we go. Okay, just <laughs> learning all sorts of things. Well, good morning to you, Embrace Church. It is great to be with you here this morning. I had the chance to meet Pastor Chris several weeks ago, and uh, we had some good email exchanges, and uh, we had a chance to sit there's a cafe down downtown Claremont that he likes to frequent, and so we got a chance to, uh, am I, am I just, sorry, Pastor Chris, if you're listening to this, I'm just kind of exposing all of your favorite spot places to be, but we, we were hanging out there, and uh, we, we sat for a couple hours and just had a really wonderful conversation. I was so blessed and encouraged by him. Um, kind of just giving me some insights about the area, about pastoral ministry. Um, you know, I love having conversations with brothers that have, that have done it for many years longer than me that have got wisdom they can pass along. And so I was, uh, I was so encouraged by that and, uh, and so honored that, that he would uh, invite me to come. And so thank you, Pastor Chris, uh, if you're listening to this after the fact, and to the elders who are here this morning, thank you for uh, inviting me and hosting me. I'm so thankful and glad to be here. Um, I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Anyone from Pennsylvania? Any Pennsylvanians in the house? One, all right, excellent, love that. And so um, I've lived kind of several places throughout the course of my uh, adult life. I actually moved to, to the Orlando region in 2013, um, served at a church here, and then in 2017 moved away. I was unmarried at the time, and so moved to the great state of Minnesota, uh, where there's this, uh, we got, he got a cheer, all right, Minnesota, that's, that doesn't usually get a cheer in Florida. People usually go, really, you moved there? Why? And so that's usually what you get, and we dealt with this lovely thing called winter. Yeah, yeah, we don't have that in this neck of the woods anymore, right? But, um, and so we've got, uh, so I, was a, I lived there for six years. I served uh, God was kind to give me opportunities to serve as a pastor and a professor um, in the Minneapolis area. I met my wife, Milena, who's here. And, um, and then God led us to this crazy adventure of, of church planting. And so last summer, summer of 2023, uh, we moved, moved back to the Orlando region. We live over here in Mineola right now, serving on staff at the Grove Church, which is in downtown Claremont. And uh, serve on staff there and enjoying that. And uh, God willing, looking to launch a new church somewhere in the region, uh, kind of South Claremont or South Winter Garden or somewhere in between. And then so uh, I do prayer, I call it prayer driving. I just drive around the area a lot and I just pray and looking around and try to meet people and looking for potential locations to, to launch a new work. And so that's, uh, that's our plan. The last several months I've been working on recruiting a launch team finding some Christians to kind of go on mission with. Let's go do this together. Let's go reach the, the, un, uh, the unchurched and the de-churched of our region. And also been doing a lot of fundraising, which is both fun and exhausting at the same time. For those of you who have done fundraising, you, you know. So that's kind of been our, our journey uh, the last uh, few months. So uh, the plan is to launch Horizon City Church, God willing, this fall. So you can learn more about it. Website, horizoncitychurch.com. If you're interested, you're not obligated to visit, but if you're interested in checking it out, horizoncitychurch.com. Uh, someone asked me recently, why, why do we need another church? Like, do we really need another church in this area? And I responded by saying, actually, we need like 50 more churches in this area, like yesterday. Um, there's been some incredible research done by various organizations, uh, both uh, the Redeemer City to City Network, which is a Presbyterian network out of New York City, as well as the North American Mission Board, which is the domestic missions board for our denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, they've both done a lot of research, and the research shows us that if we really want to see revival in any particular community, if we want to see an uptick in professions of faith, an uptick in baptisms, an uptick in church attendance, if we want to see a community being transformed by the gospel, uh, that you need approximately one gospel preaching church for about every 400 people or so that live in a community. That, that varies a little bit from community to community, but that, that pretty much has played out in Western Europe and in North America. So if, if, if a community has about 4,000 people, you really need about 10 gospel preaching churches to be able to reach that community effectively. Uh, that the more gospel preaching churches are in an area, that the, that the number of people who will respond to the gospel goes up exponentially. And so uh, you need about one for every 400. Well, right now in the Orlando metro, so that includes everything from uh, Claremont and Mineola all the way over to Sanford, 
from the north end of Apopka down to the south end of Kissimmee. So if you kind of look at the entire greater Orlando metro region, including Mount Verde, uh, the current number of churches we have in the region is about one church for about every 1,100 people. So if we really want to make an impact on this community, we need to triple the number of gospel preaching churches in our region immediately, and that's if there's no growth, population growth. I don't know if you've noticed, there's a few people moving to this area. Have you noticed that recently? And so realistically, over the next five to 40 years, we probably need to like quadruple or maybe quintuple the number of gospel preaching churches in our region if we're going to make a difference, uh, if we're going to really make a difference. And so that's the aim is for us to, is to launch a church and God willing to launch more churches and more and more and more. And so I, I'd encourage us as believers to pray to those ends, pray that God would send gospel workers and that God would raise up more churches. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray therefore to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest field. Jesus told us to pray that. And so let's, let's pray that regularly, that God would raise up pastors and missionaries to this region. And may we support them with, with, with all of our resources so to see more churches planted in this area. The, the follow-up question to that conversation someone asked me, that person asked me, was, well, okay, you explain to me why we should plant churches, but why, why are you planting a church? Like, why, why are you the guy, I'm going to, okay, uh, why are you the guy to do it? And I said, honestly, I just love serving God's people by teaching God's word. I got to be honest, I don't feel like I've ever been good at anything in my life, and I've never been comfortable doing it. I feel like every job I've ever done, I've always kind of just been okay, and, uh, and I just kind of barely make it, but I feel like with, by, with God's kindness and grace, I feel like this is the only thing in life I've ever loved, and when I had the chance to serve God's people by teaching God's word. I just feel like I was born for this. And, um, and God has been kind to give me the opportunity over and over again. God has been so kind. So again, uh, Embrace Church, thank you for having me here this morning. And thank you to our Lord and Savior Jesus for giving me the opportunity to do this. And so this morning, that's what I love to do, is to serve you by looking at a passage of scripture together and to teaching you what God's word has to say. So this morning, I want to look together at Psalm 44. If you have your Bibles, grab that, open it up, or turn it on and scroll over, whatever your preference may be. And we're going to look at Psalm 44. At, at first glance, Psalm 44 uh, does not seem like the type of psalm that would be anyone's favorite psalm. Uh, to be, yeah, I, I, when I first read this, I remember feeling a little bit, a little bit depressed by it, to be honest. It's not triumphant by any means. It doesn't strike you as a psalm that you would go, I'm going to put this on a coffee mug. Like that's, it's not that kind of psalm. It doesn't strike you that way. But Psalm 44 and psalms like it open the door for us to have conversations and to examine some sentiments in Scripture that are incredibly valuable for us as believers, particularly as we face difficulty in this life. We all know this life is hard. Life can be very, very hard and very difficult. All of us, we could go around the room and we probably all could have some painful experience that we've gone through and we could share that. All of us have been through that. And we all face moments where we are disappointed. We all have moments where we, are, where we think to ourselves, God, that's, that's not how I would have written the script. If, if I were crafting the story, that's not how it would have gone down. We, we all have those moments. We can all look back on those things in which we are disappointed. And we all have moments where we feel like, God, are you even listening to me? Where are you? What's happening? We've all had that moment. We've all had moments where we feel like, does he care about me? Does he even notice me? God, have you forgotten about me? That's the sentiment on display in Psalm 44. The authors of Psalm 44, the sons of Korah, they are in essence exclaiming those sentiments. God, where are you? Where have you been? Why have you not intervened? Have you forgotten about me? You say you love me, but it doesn't feel like it. God, where are you in this mess? So if you've ever felt those feelings, the authors of Psalm 44, they got you. They understand. They've been there. And they put to words 
the feelings that many of us have experienced. When we read words like Psalm 44, we walk away going, okay, I'm, I'm not the crazy one. Someone else gets me. In this psalm, they are lamenting, they're mourning, they're, they're crying out to God. Now, this is not totally unique. There are actually lots of laments in the psalms. There, there's 150 psalms, and 65 of them are laments. That's 43% of the largest book of the Bible is laments. It's people crying out, mourning, expressing frustrations to God. It's as if God is telling us, I'm okay if you lament to me. I, I'm I can handle it. If, if you're facing toughness or difficulty, feel free to, to, cre- to scream out to me. If you feel like I've abandoned you, feel free to exclaim it. I, I got it. I can take it. And in the Psalms, he gives us a blueprint for how to do it well. He's so kind to us that he would give us that. But this Psalm is unique in some ways from some of the other lament Psalms in that it's not merely a lament Psalm, but it's what Bible scholars call a protest lament Psalm. So you're not just lamenting about a situation, but you're lamenting as you protest against God. God, I'm sad, and I'm protesting that you haven't stopped my sadness. It's a protest lament. They're crying out. And they're in essence telling God, we're disappointed that you've not intervened in the midst of our difficulty. And at the end of this psalm, there's actually no real resolution. They just tell God they're disappointed. They exclaim their frustration. They protest. And then it's kind of over. That's kind of how the psalm ends. Again, not exactly the the psalm you would post on your Facebook page or on a coffee mug. But a few centuries later, one of the New Testament biblical authors will pick up on Psalm 44. And he actually gives us a resolution to Psalm 44. And so this morning we're going to look at Psalm 44 and then we'll jump over to the New Testament and look at how a New Testament author leverages Psalm 44 to remind us something very true about the character and nature of God. So let's pray together, if you're okay, and we'll we'll dive into the text. Father in heaven, you are so kind to us. Thank you that we are in this building this morning and we're not afraid that anyone's going to burst in the door and arrest us and drag us off because we've met in the name of Jesus. Thank you that we have that liberty here in this nation. We know that many of our brethren around the globe do not have that liberty. So God, thank you for what you've given us. And Lord, across the globe, our brethren who are meeting and worshiping you here today on a Sunday morning, on the Lord's Day, all across the world, particularly the brethren in those nations where where they do live in fear, God, would you give them special grace this morning? Would you do that? God, I pray that you would raise up more missionaries and more church planters and pastors so that we can plant more churches in this region and beyond. Would you send workers into your harvest field? God, I thank you that you are a God of kindness, that you are slow to anger. You are abounding in steadfast love, overflowing in mercy. God, I thank you. Thank you that you are that. And now I've got to ask this morning as we look at this psalm, Psalm 44, Would you speak to us? Father, would you be pleased to mold us? God, would you be pleased to use this passage of Scripture and to use your word? Would you use your inerrant word this morning to mold us to be more like Jesus? And God, if there's anyone here in this this room this morning under the sound of my voice who does not know you, I pray that today you would open their eyes. May they see you for who you truly are. And may today be the day they put their faith in Christ. In Christ alone, I ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 44, reading from the New King James Version. Look at verses 1 to 3, uh, 1 to 2 with me. It says this We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. Here, the sons of Korah, the authors of this psalm, are they're, they're reminding themselves and, and they're exclaiming what God had done in the previous generation. They're, and they're alluding to the Exodus. Right? Many of us have read the book of Exodus. We know that, that the Jewish people had served under Egyptian tyranny for, for nearly four centuries. And yet God raises up Moses to, to rescue them from, from Egypt. And he takes them into the land of Canaan. And God dispatches the people of that region and he plants the Jewish people there in that 
land. And the sons of Korah here, they're praising God for that. They're going, you did that, God. They didn't rescue themselves. They didn't have an army that could fight Pharaoh or the Egyptians. They they didn't have an army that could dispatch the the peoples living in the land of Canaan. God, this was you. And our fathers, they told us about it. The stories of what you did has been passed down to us, and we acknowledge your goodness. Now look at verse 3. It says this, For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arms save them. Like they, they didn't save themselves, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. It wasn't military might that ushered the Jews into the promised land. It was the strong arm of the Lord. So they're, remind, they're reminding themselves. Of, and then it says this in, in verse 4. You are my king, O God. Command victories from, for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God, we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Ever, forever, Selah. Here the tense changes. In the first three verses, it was, here's what God did for them. And now in these few verses, it's, here's what you have done for us. So we acknowledge the things you did of old, but we also know that you've done some stuff for us in the past. You've been faithful to us. In verse four, he says that, they they say that you are my king. Verse five, through you, we will push down our foes. In verse eight, in God, we have boasted continually. We've boasted It shifts from the great things God did for them to the great things God has done for us. And many of us can have the same sense, right? We can look back, we can read the Bible and go, God, look what all the things you did for your people throughout history. We can read church history and go, look what you have done for all these people. And those of us who love God can look back to our own lives. We can look back on the the decades of our lives and go, I remember when you did that, God, when I was 13. When you did that when I was 25. And when you did that when I was 23. And when I was 30, when I remember that, you did. I remember that. Well, we can do both. We can look back on history and our own, our own lives. That's what they're doing here. And then in verse 9 is where the lament begins, where the sentiment for the rest of the psalm is, God, we, we're starting this psalm by reminding ourselves and reminding you that we believe that you are faithful, that you've got a strong arm. You, you rescued the Egyptians, or excuse me, you rescued the Jews from, from Egypt. You, you rescued us. You've done things for us. We know you're capable of doing some stuff, but right now we're facing something painful and it feels like you're not willing to rescue us. That's that's the lament we see. Look at verse nine. Psalm 44, verse nine. In God we boast all day long, or excuse me, but you have cast us off and put us to shame. And you do not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from the enemy. And those who hate us have taken spoils for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food. There was a time where you did some great stuff for us, but right now, our armies are fighting a battle, and you're not going out with your army. Your army's losing. Our enemies, they're attacking us. They're invading. They're plundering our land. What are you doing, God? We know you're capable of rescuing us, but you're not doing it. Why? This is the moment where they feel abandoned. They feel like they've been rejected by God. And he says here, we are like sheep intended for food. We're like sheep that's going to be killed and served at the next Thanksgiving meal. What are, what are you doing, God? Uh, other English translations will render this sheep for the slaughter. That, that's what it feels like. It feels like you've just abandoned us. We're like a sheep. We're, like, we're on the chopping block, and we're getting ready to be killed. And we know you could step in and stop it, but you've refused to, and I don't know why. Look, look what he says in, in verse 12. He says, you sell your people for next to nothing. Like, not only have you sold us out, God, you didn't even get anything in return. There's, there's, there's nothing in it for you. 
Why would you not rescue us when we know you could and you claim to love us? We know you could rescue, but you didn't. And it wasn't even like you got anything out of it. It wasn't like you sold us to the enemy and got a bunch of gold in return. You sold us out for nothing. That's the feeling. Now, when we read the rest of Scripture, we, we know that not to be true. So the valuable thing in Psalm 44 is that, that the, the authors here are expressing feelings that many of us feel. Sometimes we feel like we go through a painful situation, God didn't rescue us from us, and it, from our human vantage point, it seems like there was no value to this. No, nothing good came of this. God, why did you allow this? When you, at least if I'm going to go through a painful situation, you better get something out of it. Don't waste my pain, God. That's the sentiment on display here from, from the sons of Korah. Look at verse 13. You make us a reproach to our neighbors. Other English translations would say we are, you make us a disgrace. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonor is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me. Before, because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles, because of the enemy and the avenger. Like they're, they're basically saying, God, our neighbors, they're mocking us. They're humiliating. All these years, we keep telling them how great our God is. They attack us, and God does nothing, and now they're laughing at us. <laughs> you claim you have a God that can rescue you? How stupid are you? That's what the neighbor, they're talking about us, God. I remember many years ago, I had a friend who, uh, a man in my life who got prostate cancer, and... Um, and had it multiple times over the course of 10 years, three different bouts. Went into remission and came back, went into remission. And, and then in his early 60s, he, he died. And I remember having a conversation with uh, another man in my life who was not a believer. And he goes, see, you claim, you Christians claim that God can heal, but inevitably we all die anyway. And I remember having this frustration, this, this painful feeling, like I'm, I feel humiliated that this atheist would have the audacity to speak ill of my friend who just died of cancer and using it as somehow evidence that God doesn't care about us. You prayed and God did nothing. I remember, I've remembered that moment 20 years later. I, I remember it vividly. And I remember thinking, God, you humiliated me in front of this atheist. I remember, and I remember reading Psalm 44 for the first time several years ago and thinking, that's exactly how I felt. I'm not alone. Look at verse 17. He says this. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your ways. He's like, God, we, we, didn't, we didn't do anything wrong. We, we've been faithful to you. Listen, if I had not been faithful to you, it would make perfect sense that you would let me suffer consequences in painful situations. But God, we, we've not dealt false. We, maybe other people in our nation have been crazy and sinful, but we've been good. We've followed the commands. Our hearts, we love you. We're loyal to you. We, we, we've been loyal to you. We know you can save us. You claim to, re to, to love us. You claim like you want to rescue us. And yet, here we sit. Skip down to verse 22. If we had the time, we would look at every single verse in depth. For brevity's sake, we'll skip down to verse 22. He uses the same metaphor again, the sheep to the slaughter, sheep to be served as food. Verse 22, he says this, Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. God, we're like sheep headed for the slaughterhouse. We're about to be killed, and it feels to us like you're sitting back and watching and doing nothing when we know you could do something. Then he says this in verse 23. This is the prayer to God. If you've ever felt this, you can read this. And he says this in verse 24. He's talking to God. Awake! Why do you sleep, O Lord? Are you taking a nap? It's a little disrespectful, actually. Maybe more than just a little. But this is the raw emotion he's feeling. God wants us to give us a, he, this psalm in the Bible gives us permission to go, when you feel those raw emotions, express them to God. He wants you to express them to him. 
He says to God, God, you got to be asleep. That's the only, the only reasonable explanation for what's going on in my life, for this painful thing I'm facing right now that you're refusing to rescue me from. The only rational reason I can come up with is because you're taking a nap. You fell asleep on the couch or something. That's, that's the idea that's being expressed here. In, in, the, in the latter verses of this psalm, he begins to remind himself that God loves him, but, he, but he's confused. He's like, if God didn't love me, this would actually make sense. When I'm facing the painful situation and God doesn't rescue me, when it makes sense, well, God doesn't love me. Of course he's not gonna rescue me. But, but God does love me. He says he loves. So why is he not stepping in? God could change the heart of the wayward child that I pray for every day. God could have protected us from that person who, who harmed us, from that person who stole from us or, or scammed us or harmed our business. God could have protected us from the, the unjust boss who fired us unjustly. God could have protected, protected me from the, the painful marriage. God could have changed my spouse's heart before that spouse betrayed me. God could have stopped the miscarriages. God could have intervened and reconciled the broken relationships. God could stop the earthquakes or the hurricanes or the forest fires. God could stop wicked people from corrupting great companies. God could heal the cancer. God could stop the chronic pain. God could deliver us from the depression. God could do all of those things like that. And he says he loves us. And he says he takes joy in rescuing us. So God, why have you not come through? Why have you not stepped in? We are like sheep headed for the slaughter. And then Psalm 44 just kind of ends. That's it. No resolution, no happy times, no question, no answer to the question being posed. But several centuries later, a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus comes along. And he is converted to Christ and he becomes the greatest missionary evangelist the world has ever seen. We know him as the Apostle Paul and he writes a letter to the church in Rome. And in Romans chapter eight, he quotes from Psalm 44. So if you have your Bibles, flip over. The last thing we'll look at is Romans chapter eight. The Apostle Paul answers the question. The sons of Korah in Psalm 44 have posed this question. God, we, if you're able and if you love me, why have you not? Or put it differently, they would say, they're, at, they're basically asking, God, do you still love me? I'm facing this painful situation. I don't understand it. God, it feels like you don't love me anymore. Do you really still love me? That's the question being posed, and that's the question that Paul answers in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is one of the most glorious passages of all of Scripture. It is theologically dense. There are dozens of themes running through this chapter. And in my opinion, one of the most comforting passages of, of Scripture that God has given us. It is in Romans 8, we get one of the most famous verses, Romans 8, 28. If you have it, you can look at that there. We know that all things work together, together for the good of those who love God. Not some things, not most things, not a few things. All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Paul says that. So if you're facing a painful situation in your life, Paul's saying, I want you to know this. That thing is going to be worked out, and God is going to use that for your good. I can't see with my human eyes how it's going to work out for my good. I know you can't, but don't worry. God has got it under control. This did not catch God by surprise. God is not surprised by the cancer diagnosis. God is not surprised by the prodigal child that is, that is refusing to, to listen. God is not surprised by the financial difficulty you may face. God is not surprised by the relational fractures you've experienced. God is not surprised by any painful thing you've ever walked through in this life. He's not surprised. In verse 29, he says this, that God foreknew that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's saying, God has predestined that you as a believer will end up looking like Jesus. Well, I gotta be honest, today, I don't always look like Jesus. The way I behave and conduct myself, sometimes I'm like Jesus, 
A lot of times I'm not like Jesus. Sometimes I love my wife well, the way Jesus would want me to love her. Sometimes I don't do a really good job. Sometimes I'm kind of a cruddy husband. Sometimes I'm a really good dad. Sometimes I'm not such a great dad. Sometimes I'm like Jesus. A lot of times I'm not like Jesus. I'm irritable and moody, annoyed, easily annoyed, not patient, not gentle. I don't know about you. I mean, maybe I'm the only sinner in the house, but I, I, I regularly walk through moments where I go, ah, I am not like Jesus. So Paul goes, Kenny, there's going to come a day where you are exactly like Jesus. Not in his divine nature, but in his behavior, in your sanctification. I am molding you where sin is going to be eradicated from you and you're going to be in glory like him, enjoying him forever and ever. And all the things in this life, I'm going to use to contribute. And when you get to the future, when you get to that glorious moment in eternity, you're going to look back and God's going to go, remember that painful thing that didn't make sense? You were frustrated I didn't rescue you? I used that thing to change this thing in your heart. You didn't notice it at the time. But 10 years later, a few of your friends noticed it. And then this other painful thing I used to to do this other thing. And I, I, I continue to use all these painful moments to mold you because I've got your final destination in mind. Right now, all you care about is being rescued from this painful moment. And while it is painful and it hurts, I've got a grander vision in mind. I'm making you to be like my son, the Father is telling us through Paul here. God predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So in those moments where we're going, God, why? Why have you done this? Paul's giving us a great reminder that all things work together. And then in the final sections of Romans chapter 8, he begins to tell us that God loves us. And he wants us to be confident in God's love for us. Look at verse 35, Romans 8, 35. He says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? Is there anything in this life that could separate you from the love of God? Question mark. But he doesn't answer the question immediately. He kind of lets it linger for a bit. He goes, you're facing painful situations and you're tempted to think, because of this painful situation, has God forgotten me? Has he abandoned me? Does he no longer love me? You will be tempted to feel that and think that. And he's asking, is it possible for you to be separated from the love of God? And he lets it linger for a moment. He doesn't answer it immediately. And then he quotes from Psalm 44. Psalm 44, verse 22, is quoted in Romans 8, verse 36. Can anything separate us from the love of God? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are being regarded as sheep for the slaughter. Can anything separate you from the love of God? I mean, remember, we feel sometimes like we're sheep headed for the slaughter. He is is hearkening back to Psalm 44, and the question that was posed there was, God, do you still love me? And here in Romans 8, he is saying, can anything separate you? I mean, right? Besides, we all know, sometimes we have those Psalm 44 moments. He lingers for a moment there. And then he, then he gloriously answers the question in, Psalm, in, in Romans 8. Does this mean that God has stopped loving you? Romans 8, verse 37. No. In all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Embrace church. God loves you. And when you have Psalm 44 moments where you go, I'm facing a painful moment and it feels like God doesn't love me, the Apostle Paul shouts to you, I know how you're feeling. You're not crazy. But this is going to work out for your good. 
Oh, you hold on in there. Don't worry, it's going to work out. I know you can't see it. I know you don't understand, but it's going to work out for your good. And listen to me, I promise you, nothing in this creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We all have Psalm 44 moments. The antidote is Romans 8. God, do you still love me? Oh, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We see this elsewhere in Scripture. John 16, 27 says, The Father himself loves you. Ephesians 2, 4 says that God is rich in mercy because of a great love with which he has loved us. He has loved us with a great love. Titus 3, 4 says this, When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, when the goodness and loving kindness of our God appeared, not because of works done by us, but because of his own mercy. Why did Jesus show up and show us this good, loving kindness? Because, because of something we did? No. Because he's just full of mercy. Romans 5.8 says this, God shows us his love in this way, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, when you were at your worst, Christ died for you. When you were God's enemy, he died for you. When you were on the naughty list, he said, that's the one. I love her. I love him. I want that person in my own family, and I will do whatever it takes to rescue them and bring them into my family. That is mega love. Mega off-the-charts love. A steadfast love that is incomprehensible to the human mind. 1 John 4, 9 says this, God sent his son into the world so that the love of God would be made manifest so that we might live through him. Jesus came to this earth to tell you God loves you so that his love would be made manifest among you. So in the moments where you're facing pain, and you're going, does he still love me? Remember, he sent his son to die for you. And of course, one of the most famous Bible verses in all of, the, all of scriptures, John 3, 16. Many of us know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God is already demonstrated his great love to you. And he has promised that love will never fade. That nothing you face in this moment, in this world, will ever separate you from the love of God. There, there are moments where you will have Psalm 44 moments. You're not crazy. That's okay. Tell him how you feel. And when you're tempted to think to yourself, he has stopped loving me, pause and remember Romans 8. When you're when you're, when you're tempted to say, God, wake up, do something, you pause and remember that he said, I have loved you with a fierce love. That while you were at your worst, while we were still sinners, he died for us. Remember the words of Romans 8, that nothing in this life will ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. In just a moment, we're gonna, we're gonna sing a song together. And... Um, what I'd love you to do is a moment while we sing, maybe you close your eyes and just kind of think about your own Psalm 44 moments. Yeah. Actually, I ask you to just close your eyes right now if you're willing. If it's not too weird, just close your eyes. And just try to think about your own Psalm 44 moments. The moments where you have felt like, man, God, you abandoned me. Do, do you still love me? And then remind yourself of the Romans 8 truth. Remind yourself of what he has said in his word. And as you have your eyes closed, I'll just, I'll read it one more time for us. The Apostle Paul. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present in this world, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
God, I pray this morning for your people. God, I pray that this truth would comfort your people this morning and would inspire them this morning. May the sentiments on display in Psalm 44 and the, res- the resolution displayed in Romans 8, may those truths comfort us, God, when we're facing difficult moments. May they inspire us. May they strengthen our souls. God, may the truth of your word mold us, I pray. Father, thank you for the book of Psalms that puts words to our emotions when many of us are feeling things that we can't express. God, thank you for your holy scripture, your inerrant word that gives us insights into how to grapple with our own emotions. God, we don't always understand how we feel, how to express how we feel, but your word gives words to our feelings. Thank you, God. And your word reminds us that even when we feel like you are far, you are not far. You are working all things out for our good, that you are intervening in our behalf. God, would you help us to believe that? Help us to trust you. Help us to choose to trust you, even when it doesn't make sense from a human perspective. God, would you give us the grace to do that well? God, we choose to trust you. We know that your ways are better than our ways, and you know what's best. God, thank you for reminding us of your love, that your love is strong, and that nothing in this creation could separate us from you, no matter what we face. God, when we have our own Psalm 44 moments, May, may your Holy Spirit remind us of the words of Romans 8. May our Psalm 44 moments lead us to Romans 8 moments. Moments of despair, Holy Spirit, lead us in the moments of comfort where we experience your kindness and we are reminded of your love. And God, no matter what we face in this life, help us to honor you well. No matter what suffering we face, help us to, obedient, to be obedient to your word for your glory for the praise of your glorious grace and for the fame of the name of Jesus in this world and beyond. I ask all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.